set up, I want to introduce uh, Stefan Wager. He is uh, an assistant professor of operations, information and technology at um, Stanford University um, in the Graduate School of Business. Um, and he's also an assistant professor of statistics by courtesy. Um, I believe he's actually a Stanford lifer. I think he did his undergrad here and his um, PhD in statistics and now his faculty. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it is a, it is a beautiful place. <laughs> Um, uh, so his research lies in the intersection of causal inference, optimization, and statistical learning. Um, and he's particularly interested in developing new solutions to classical problems, kind of at the intersection of decision-making, economics, and statistics that also um, kind of leverage recent developments in machine learning. I'll say that um, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with him and one of his students over the last couple of years, and it's been really exciting to get to sort of better understand um, some of the new insights from econometrics. Um, I'm still early in that learning process, but it's really um, exciting to hear about those other techniques and that also we've been collaborating and just illustrate the range of the work that he's doing on um, some healthcare work now um, and looking at uh, different questions around comparing supervised machine learning versus um, sort of causal counterfactual models. Um, so uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, take it away. Thanks, thanks a lot, Emma, for the uh, invitation and for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today I want to talk about something that it, it, it's, a, it's a topic from causal inference that I think hasn't received much attention in reinforcement learning so far, uh, but it seems to me that there should be a lot of connections between the two, so that's why uh, I wanted to talk about that today. Um, and the topic is uh, interference. So what I mean by that, um, the interference is that, okay, most literature on evaluating a policy, um, including in reinforcement learning, in bandits, in causal inference and so forth, is focused on a setting uh, where if you take an action um, on one unit, you affect that unit. If I give you surgery, I may help you survive. I'm probably not gonna help your friend survive by giving you surgery, right? Uh, but in many applications, the assumption just isn't right. Like if we're thinking about vaccines, if your friend gets a COVID vaccine, like that's totally gonna help you not get COVID also. Um, so here, if the action is vaccination, vaccination doesn't just affect the person who's vaccinated, it'll affect others too. Um, on a, on a different note, in a housing setting, if your friend gets a housing subsidy and they use it to buy a house, uh, then that's going to reduce the housing supply in your area, and that'll make it it'll raise high prices and it'll make it harder for you to buy a house. So there's just this kind of large class of application across different areas where an action taken on one person affects others too, and if you don't account for this, you're just going to I mess up when you're estimating the effect, evaluating the effect of a policy overall. So what I wanted to talk about today is just at a high level, what are some good models for capturing this kind of interference? What kind of results can we prove in, in the context of these models and how much harder is interference to make policy evaluation? Uh, so in this talk, I actually won't be doing any RL, which may be kind of funny given them, um, given the topic of this session. But on the other hand, like what's RL, right? you have at least a single trajectory RL. You have a single trajectory and in time, you have a bunch of action points where you can do something and write the whole problem in RL is kind of, I want to understand how an action taken today affects me today, but also affects me tomorrow and the day after by changing a state or something. And what's interference? You have a bunch of units. They're not spread in time, they're spread in space. Um, and now kind of taking an action on one unit in space is gonna affect other people elsewhere in space. Uh, so in that sense, kind of interference is just the transpose of the RL problem. Of course, there are a lot of differences. In RL, you have this kind of temporal structure. You can write down an MDP. We're very good at that kind of modeling. Um, spatial interference, kind of other types of interference, the modeling work isn't as well developed, but uh, there should still be a bunch of connections. So, okay. Uh, before talking about interference, I just wanted to kind of briefly say what is the kind of simplest thing you can do without interference, and that's kind of maintenance analysis of the randomized trial. We want to see does giving you surgery help you survive? Well, what are we going to do? We're going to write down two potential outcomes y0, y1, what would have happened to you without surgery or with surgery. Uh, and then the main result is that if 
assignment of surgery was random, then you can take average survival for people who got surgery versus average survival for people who didn't. And that's a consistent estimate of the average treatment effect that is the average effect of surgery uh, on survival. This is very nice. Highlights the central role of randomization. But what's very important here is that this notation kind of rules out interference kind of automatically. Uh, it, when I write down yi zero, what this means is that there's no way that kind of your friend getting surgery could affect you in any way in this notation. Um, once we allow for interference, the world looks different. We don't just have two potential outcomes. It's not like you could have been treated or not treated and that's what determines your outcome. There's actually, if there are N people in your study, there are two to the N treatment combinations you could give to those N people. And your outcome could in principle depend on all two to the N uh, treatment assignments. So now you have exponentially many potential outcomes in sample size, uh, which is kind of a problem. Uh, I, I don't think it's possible to solve this in general, right? Uh, if you have linearly increasing sample size and you have exponentially increasing complexity, like what are you supposed to do? So in order to do anything, we need to make assumptions. We need to assume some kind of structure on the interference mechanism uh, so we can get rid of this exponential blow up. And we also need to carefully define our causal estimate uh, uh, or kind of the policy uh, we want to evaluate in order to make progress. So today I want to talk about kind of two very different ways uh, of doing this. Uh, the first, I think this is kind of by far the most prevalent in the statistics literature, and this kind of generalizes the, the classical work on randomized trials nicely, is to kind of, you're going to assume a graph and you're going to use that graph to collapse down the space of two to the n potential outcomes you'd have to deal with usually. So we're going to assume that we have our n units. We're going to put them on vertices of a graph and we're gonna draw an edge between any two units uh, if treatment given to one can also affect uh, the other. So this is called network interference. I'm also gonna pair it with this assumption of an anonymous interference, which this is an assumption people usually make uh, in this model also. And this is that if you're node number four, uh, you have neighbors, your nodes are no neighbors five, two, and three, uh, you actually don't care about exactly who got treated among these three neighbors. You only care about what fraction of your neighbors got treated. So if you have 10 people you interact with, um, maybe you don't care about exactly who gets vaccinated. You just care about seven out of 10 getting vaccinated. And with this, as soon as then your potential outcomes collapse, right? They just, now you depend on, they depend on uh, your treatment assignment and the average treatment assignment for your neighbors. And this is kind of a special case of what Arno and Sandy call an exposure mapping. And kind of now, now we're in business. Um, we still need to define a causal estimate, uh, but here there, there are many reasonable things you can do. Um, one natural way to decompose this is that you can define, if we're again thinking about vaccination, you can think about the total effect. Uh, so this would assume like how much would the kind of average number of cases of a disease go down if you go up from vaccinating 60 to 70% of the population. Um, then you can talk about the direct effect. Given the current situation, what is the protective effect for you getting vaccinated yourself on your own avoidance of the disease? And then there's the indirect effect, which is kind of every way you benefit from the vaccine that's not captured by the direct effect. Um, and the sum of the direct and indirect effects is the total effect. And this connects nicely to kind of what we usually do because the direct effect, in, in the case of a randomized trial with no interference, the direct effect is just the average treatment effect whereas the indirect effect is zero. And like the presence of interference means that the indirect effect becomes not zero. And like I said, this is kind of a pretty popular model for doing interference in both statistics and econometrics. So there's a bunch of work on this. Uh, in the case of the direct effect, I mentioned kind of the direct effect is the thing that in a randomized trial just becomes the average treatment effect we're used to estimating. And there's here, I just put in some of the most recent references, but these have references to older stuff also. Uh, Sevia Arnon and Hutchins show that essentially if you pretend that you have data from a randomized trial, uh, but you actually have interference, then you're gonna end up estimating the direct effect and you, they give some balance on how fast you estimate the direct effect. This D depends on the degree of the graph. So they show that you're generally gonna be consistent if you're not too dense, but the denser the graph, the worse your balance gets. 
And for the indirect effect, it's harder, as you might expect, but there are still some results in kind of specific models. OK, I kind of, I guess I pitched this as a, as a general kind of overview talk, but I also, of course, want, do want to talk about some kind of recent things I've been thinking about in this space uh, that, that I'm excited about, maybe kind of connect to some uh, mathematical ideas others in this community have been looking at. So, so one thing I've been thinking about recently, so here are these bounds. Um, they, they're all in the setting where kind of first you place your node, your units on the vertices of a graph, then you draw some edges between them, and then you try to do analysis that would be valid for any graph. Um, and I guess we know like there can be some weird graphs and difficult graphs to deal with. So what we wanted to ask is like, can you do better if you kind of focus on some typical graphs as opposed to just kind of arbitrarily bad graphs? Um, and you kind of, there's a lot of literature on kind of probabilistic or random graphs. And can we use results from this literature to kind of make progress? So as kind of a first step in this direction, um, we looked at one specific generative model for graphs. Uh, this is the graph on. So just very quickly, we essentially assume that any two nodes have a type and given two types of nodes, there's some affinity. And based on this affinity, you flip a coin. If it comes up heads, then you draw an edge between the two nodes, otherwise not. So this is kind of a widely studied uh, model for random graphs. And we consider this in a dense and a sparse setting. And we just wanted to see how well can you estimate direct and indirect effects um, in this kind of setting. Um, so our first result, and I thought this was quite encouraging, is, I'll just go back quickly. Uh, remember for the direct effect, we have general results showing that kind of familiar estimators for the average treatment effect in randomized trials are consistent for the direct effect. But this paper, it doesn't give a distribution of this estimator and it gives some bounds for the error, but these bounds generally get worse in dense graphs. Um, on the other hand, what we show is that if we're willing to make these graph on generative assumptions, um, then not only do we get consistency, but we get an exact distributional result. We get a central limit theorem. Um, and actually your rate of convergence doesn't depend on how dense the graph is. Whether you're dense or sparse, you always get root and rates of convergence for the direct effect. Um, and the kind of variance inflation you get due to interference is this term QI. It depends on the graph on in this kind of way that you can write down. Um, so this was kind of a first encouraging result showing that kind of interesting stuff does happen under interference and, and kind of depending on how you model, you might get kind of much more optimistic looking results uh, than you'd think otherwise. Um, could you give us this brief intuition for why it shouldn't explicitly depend on the degree of change? Yeah, so, so I, I, I know like your first intuition would be right, like the more neighbors you have, like surely the more noise there should be. But now one thing that's doing a lot of work is here, we don't care about, if we're looking at vaccination, we don't care about exactly the identities of your neighbors who are vaccinated. We just care about what fraction of people you talk to are vaccinated. And what ends up happening here is kind of the more neighbors you have, the less kind of any given neighbor can affect you, the fraction of vaccinated neighbors. So th this is kind of the intuition for why kind of this, this washes out. Um, on, on a technical level, then you, you, it's a Hansen Wright type concentration argument that shows that the interactions between who gets kind of two different uh, neighbors being treated um, goes away. And this QI, if you stare at it, uh, you can see that this is, this is I'm gonna like push forward thing. It's like, it measures if I get treated, how much does this on average push other people's responses up? Um, so for every person you contribute to the variance by like a direct thing and an indirect thing. And then you get a central limit there. Um, yeah. So this is, this is one result. We also looked at the indirect effect. Um, this was actually interesting. You could, um, you could imagine doing the indirect effect. So, so remember that the indirect effect asks um, kind of if we go from vaccinating 60 to 61% of people, how does, um, how does the kind of uh, prevalence of disease change in a way that kind of goes beyond the direct effect? 
And what you could imagine doing is you could kind of do a Horvitz-Thompson type estimator where you kind of look at kind of, you have people who have a bigger or smaller fraction of uh, treated neighbors and try to use that kind of weighting um, based on how many of your neighbors are treated um, to kind of try to extrapolate to different treat treatment fractions. And this implies a very kind of nice looking estimator of the indirect effect is this form. It's kind of a correlation between your outcome and your fraction of treated neighbors. And this looks nice. And I think when we first saw this, I was like, this is, this is gonna be good. But it actually turns out this is not a good estimator. In a, any kind of reasonable setting, this estimator is gonna diverge. Uh, its variance blows up. And so this was, this was weird. Um, here, I'm gonna go too fast for you to the paper if you're interested. It turns out kind of when you look at this in detail, the variance blows up, uh, but all the problematic variance is kind of in direction that's aligned with principal components of the graph log. So essentially, if, and it turns out you can get rid of this by doing the following. Like take the edge matrix, uh, run PCA on the edge matrix, look at the principal components, take project out all the noise that's in the direction of these PCs, and then run this estimator after projecting out that noise. And, and, and that thing works. Um, and it's going to satisfy a central limit theorem again. Uh, where here your rate of convergence is going to depend on the sparsity. Um, the sparser the graph, the better you went. OK, uh, so this is something you can do here also. But OK, so this was one model, network interference. It kind of lets you very directly add potential outcome, like add interference into the potential outcome model. You can put structure on this interference thing. And then you can prove some results in general. You can prove stronger results under random graph assumptions. I, I think this is kind of a, it's statistically a very nice model. I expect there to be much more to say about it. Um, uh, but so this is one way to capture interference effects. Um, I promise though that I wouldn't just give one model. I'd give kind of talk about different ways of incorporating interference. And talk, I mentioned the housing subsidies earlier. Um, Another version of this that gets, gets a lot of attention in economics is in understanding the effect of agricultural subsidies. Um, if I subsidize one for a farmer, uh, they're probably going to produce a lot more corn. Uh, if I subsidize all the corn farmers, uh, they're going to produce really a lot more corn. Uh, this is, but demand is what it is. Uh, so this is going to uh, reduce the price of corn, and this is going to yield smaller effects. Kind of, if you want to understand the effect of subsidies, you need to you know, be able to capture this kind of interference effect. This is kind of a very generic phenomenon in any kind of economic application. And what happens here is there's clearly interference, right? Subsidies, actions taken on some people are also going to affect outcomes for others. But maybe here, network interference doesn't feel like such a natural tool anymore. I'm right, because essentially there is no network structure. I don't care which farmer is producing more corn. I just care that more corn is being produced and that this depresses prices and I can make less money by producing corn. So there's no network structure, but interference is mediated by something else that we also understand well, right? Interference is mediated by prices that come from kind of matching supply with demand. And what can you say here? Uh, so now we'll do this differently. Instead of kind of trying to build a, a more general theoretical results, I'll just talk about something we did in a very concrete application. Uh, uh, we're kind of motivated by very concrete application. This is, uh, suppose you have a platform that's um, trying to kind of connect freelance labor uh, with a demand for labor. And they're trying to optimize incentives for workers to join the platform. Um, if you want to think about this in terms of kind of a familiar application, you could think of like Lyft figuring out how much to pay uh, drivers uh, to drive the Lyft, but it's kind of um, applies to any freelance uh, work platform. And so here we're going to assume a model where in every time period, uh, the platform can learn over time. And in every time period, the platform first kind of chooses how much to pay people, uh, how, how much to pay people to work, uh, then kind of given this payment, potential workers think, uh, how much are they going to get paid? 
they're also going to look at kind of if they do choose to work, what's the chance, say, if they're driving for left, that they're actually going to get to drive or that they're just going to sit there idle uh, with no one asking for a ride. And then they kind of look at their expected revenue. Uh, they compare that to an outside option. And then they choose to join the platform. And we're going to assume that the system is in equilibrium. So this is just kind of a very concrete model that kind of gives rise to these equilibrium effects I was talking about earlier. If you pay some people more, you make them more likely to work. Oh, that means that they're going to soak up more demand. So that leaves less demand for others. And when you're trying to choose an optimal policy, you need to account for those effects. So yeah, any, any approach to learning should account for cannibalization effects. Um, how can you do this? There are essentially uh, two, two approaches uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, one is you could just kind of every day try different policies and, and deploy them globally. Uh, you could, today you could try to kind of pay everyone $15 per unit of work. And tomorrow you try paying everyone $20 per unit of work. And there's no interference because you're always intervening on everyone. So that's fine. Or there's kind of no bias for missing interference because you're always uh, intervening on everyone. So that's good. The downside is you essentially have a very small sample size because every time you take an action, you have to interfere on everyone. And if there are any kind, of any kind of idiosyncrasies by day, like there's a supply increase or uh, decrease that day, uh, that noise hits you very hard. Uh, I should mention this is a special case of derivative free stochastic optimization, which is kind of something that's been studied a lot in the, in the you know, banded literature. Or then the question is, can we do something better by actually thinking about where this interference is coming from, it's coming from kind of price equilibrium effects. And so then can we use equilibrium modeling to kind of fix gradient descent and do something more uh, uh, familiar gradient optimization type of stuff here. And okay, I'm not gonna have the time today to go into detail about what to do exactly, but just kind of a very high level intuition is what we're gonna imagine doing is if currently we were thinking of paying everyone $15 per unit of work, then we're actually randomly going to offer to pay some people $15 and 10 cents and others $14 and 90 cents. We're going to kind of put small mean zero perturbations. And then you can regress people's choice of participating in the marketplace against these small mean zero perturbations. And this is going to give you an estimate of a marginal response function that is in equilibrium. How sensitive are people to being paid a little bit more? This marginal response function, of course, is not what we care about because it ignores cannibalization effects. But kind of the main result of the paper is that we understand where cannibalization comes from. It comes from price um, equilibrium effects. And then once you have this marginal response effect, then you can actually do totally reasonable things that one could hope to do in practice and turn delta hat into an estimate of the policy relevant gradient. And the reason this is possible is essentially there are two things going on in the marketplace. There's one that's kind of very mechanistic, supply, demand, respond to each other in some way, and that we understand. And then there's this very kind of inscrutable part of the problem where different people have different outside options and different people will choose to kind of work for you under different conditions. And there are so many different types of people you could never hope to learn that. But it turns out that this delta hat, this marginal response function already captures all the strange ways in which people are different in the way we need it. So kind of mapping from this to a policy relevant gradient only involves kind of uh, calculations one could do uh, given reasonable information. So um, anyways, uh, like I said, if I unfortunately don't have the time to go into more detail about how this works exactly, other than I wanted, did want to say that this makes a huge difference in practice. If you can kind of capture these equilibrium effects and do kind of gradient-based learning as opposed to kind of zero order gradient free learning that kind of just gives everyone the same intervention, you can be much more accurate. So here's results from one simulation example. You could worry about kind of your learning, how much regret did you incur during the learning phase. You could then kind of think about deploying a decision in the future. How well are you doing there? Here's the method we're looking at that kind of uses equilibrium effects uh, to kind of equilibrium model to correct gradient descent. We converge very fast. You can have negligible regret. 
whereas here are kind of different variants of zeroth order optimization. This family, we didn't know how to tune it, so we just did all the things. Uh, so you can get different trade-offs between how well you do in sample versus in the future, but they're just an order of magnitude difference in how accurate you are. And if you don't believe that we implemented the simulation fairly, then we also have a theorem, which is in large systems. Uh, this is kind of with a bunch of, by large systems, I mean with kind of a bunch of workers. So you don't have these kind of small sample combinatorial effects of who, who chooses to work or not. Um, we show that kind of under reasonable assumptions, we get log T regret as we learn over time, we can learn quickly. Uh, whereas global experimentation can't do better than uh, root T regret. So there's a big separation. And again, at least the proof of the lower bound is essentially follows directly from, from this work on derivative free stochastic optimization. It's just not possible to get good rates there. So anyways, I think according to my timekeeping, I have two minutes left. So I just wanted to kind of close by saying that um, most work on policy evaluation kind of assumes that if you intervene on one unit, uh, only that unit uh, responds. Uh, but in many applications, interference actually plays a central role. Uh, and if you don't account for interference, you're going to get the wrong answer uh, as to the effect of a policy. There, there are many ways of adding interference into a model. Um, here, I just wanted to talk about two different ways of doing this. Network interference kind of generalizes the potential outcomes model uh, and lets us add interference in a kind of familiar setting. Um, on the other hand, this kind of equilibrium modeling, this kind of seems closer to game theory. Uh, we, we, uh, we understand that kind of there's a shared resource, different people are gonna be competing for this shared resource and reacting to each other's decisions uh, based on their own utility functions. Uh, but, again, but again, then you can re use results from game theory to understand these equilibrium effects. And this can be kind of help you capture interference effects in different applications. And yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, maybe this is just me being dogmatic, but kind of in, in enough generality, you could think of single trajectory RL as having a bunch of units that are connected by a temporal, um, and, uh, temporal kind of ordered in time. And then an MDP would be just another way of kind of connecting how actions taken on one unit affect others. So anyways, there's a bunch of way of doing this. And I think there is a lot of work to be done into kind of building interference into our policy evaluation toolkit. Um, that's both a lot of exciting physical questions and, and I think a lot of uh, impact in being able to uh, solve important problems better. Anyways, that's all I had for today. And here are kind of references to papers I talked about, and these have references kind of much more broadly uh, to this literature. So, thank you. Thanks for the great talk. Um, uh, we have time for like maybe one or two questions before the next person. Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Um, uh, excellent talk, Stefan. I think this is an excellent uh, problem to study. Um, so I'm wondering what, what is the connection to say multi-agent reinforcement learning with like say uh, agents as large as N? So it looks like uh, you are incorporating some uh, specific assumptions on how, how these um, like a large number of agents are, are interacting with each other. Yes, um, exactly. Uh, I. Uh, I, I should, in, in asking this question, you probably have some specific references in mind that I'm not familiar with. So I, if, you, if you have something like that to, to, to share, I'd be very happy to take a look. Uh, mo most of kind of, uh, when I was thinking about this, I've been thinking about kind of from the perspective of the causal inference and economics literatures on this kind of stuff. Um, I, yeah, I was just referring to the talk yesterday by, by, by Dimitri. <laughs> Sorry, unfortunately. I <laughs> Was it's it's I, I wish we could have all been in person because then it's much more easy to just sit there. But now it's still like the usual meetings are still there, so I haven't been able to watch that video yet, unfortunately. Yeah, another thing is that I, I think it it's, might make sense to think about in the network setting to think about say stochastic block models or uh, mixed membership stochastic block models and so on. So so you can like work on the groups and different groups of agents, so you don't have to to deal with a really uh, huge number of agents. 
So that, that could be a promise in direction. I think. So, so in the in the network setting, right? The the graph one model we're looking at that's generalized. Oh, I see. Stochastic I see. block model. I see. So, and and in the paper, many of the examples we have are for the stochastic block model because that's okay. like very awesome. easy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I guess we need to move on to the next speaker. Um, is Mihailo there? Um, hey, Sean. Hey, Stefan. So if you could stop sharing your screen and let Mihailo um, go in. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, man. Yeah, it is painful to be so far away from you guys. So it's a pleasure to introduce Mihailo Ivanovich, uh, uh, one of um, many amazing stories that come out of UC Santa Barbara. Uh, Mihail 